As you become more aligned on home automation, it makes more sense to run Home Assistant as a virtual machine. And while you can download and install pre-built ones, you'll get a lot more flexibility if you install Home Assistant on top of a Debian operating system. But how do you do a Home Assistant supervised installation? Well, if that's something that you're interested in finding out, then stick around and watch this video, because that's what we'll be going over. Now, if you take a look at the requirements for a Home Assistant supervised installation, you'll see that the operating system that you need to use is Debian version 11, or at least at the time of this recording. Now, I'm going to make an assumption you already know how to install this. And in fact, you've actually already got a computer that's running Debian version 11. So in my case, I've got a virtual machine that's been set up with two CPUs, four gig of RAM, and just the default 32 gig of disk storage space that Proxmox here has set aside. Now, you can use other hypervisors if you like, but what I do prefer in particular about Proxmox is that it's got a built-in firewall feature set, which means I can actually protect this virtual machine from other computers on the network. Now, the first thing to do is to log into your computer using SSH. And that's because it's going to be a lot easier to do this through a remote session than it is through a console, because we'll be able to do copying and pasting. Next thing is to swap over to the root account. And then we want to make sure that the computer is up to date. So I'm running apt update and apt upgrade. Now, one other thing that I would suggest is to either make sure that this computer has got a static IP address or you're reserving an IP address for it through DHCP. That way, the IP address is always the same. This makes it a lot easier to set up firewall rules, especially within a smart home environment, because you'll want to restrict what those computers can actually get access to, uh, especially if you want to restrict access to the internet only to devices that you can trust. Now, the next thing to do is to install the dependencies. But before you do that, I would suggest checking out the actual installation documentation just to make sure that what we're going to be installing on this video is actually correct because these dependencies can change and I can only report what's actually being told at the time of the recording. So as an example, systemd-journal-remote wasn't on the list when I first installed this, but it is now. So that's just something you need to be aware of is that other dependencies might get added. So it, it definitely pays to just double check this actual documentation first. But what we now need to do is go back to our remote session and I'll paste in my command, hit return, and it's going to install quite a lot of actual um, packages that it, the actual software that we want to install is dependent on. Now, the next thing to do is to install the Docker Community Edition. So I'll paste in a command for that. I'll then hit return. And then that's going to download and install that software. Just bear in mind, it can actually take a while. Now, the next thing that we need to install is the OS agent. And I would suggest checking out this GitHub repository just to make sure that you've got the latest version. At the time of recording, it's version 1.41. So we actually need to download the Debian package for our computer. Now, which actual file you want really depends on the actual processor you're using. In my case, it's your typical 64-bit Intel or AMD processor. There's no sign of a 64-bit version here, but if I click the option to show all 13 assets, there's the 64-bit version. So to make life easier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click over that link and select Copy Link. Go back to my SSH session, type in wget. I'll paste that URL in, hit Return, and it's downloaded the file. Next thing I need to do is to actually use the package manager to install that. So I'll just paste that command in, hit return, and it installs the OS agent. So now we need to download and install the Home Assistant supervised package. So I'm going to paste in the command for that. Now, this particular one, it's always pointing to the actual latest version. So unlike the OS agent, you don't have to keep checking to make sure you are downloading the latest version. It's going to do that anyway. So I'm going to hit return and there's our file downloaded. So I'm now going to get the package manager to actually install this. So I'll paste in the command for that, hit return. Now, 
One thing I'm going to point out is that this actual installation, it actually pulls a computer on the internet. So you need to make sure that the actual computer does have access to it. Otherwise you could run into issues. But once that's finished, it comes back. It actually tells me what URL I can point um, to to actually connect to Home Assistant, but also it's telling me that a reboot is required, in which case I need to do that next. Well, once the computer's been rebooted and Home Assistant's been given enough time to actually start up, if you point your web browser to the IP address of your Home Assistant computer and port 8123, you'll be taken to the typical onboarding wizard that you get for any Home Assistant installation. So I'll just put in some details here. And then create that new account. It wants to know where I'm at. By default, it picks out Amsterdam, but obviously you'd want to change that. I'll click on next. We can provide anonymized information to the actual developers if you choose. By default, it doesn't. So we'll just click on next for the sake of this video. Now, at this point, we're basically finished. You can either start setting things up now or later if you want, but I'm just going to click the finish button. And then there we've got our actual Home Assistant all ready to go. Well, now that Home Assistant's been installed, how you actually use it and look after it is more or less the same, albeit we're using a Debian operating system now. So for example, if I want to install an add-on, I'll go to settings and then I'll go to add-ons and then click add-on store. If I want to install integration, I'll go to settings, devices and services, and I'll click add integration. So that's pretty much just the same. And then when you start to get updates for either the core operating system of Home Assistant or integrations or add-ons you've got, as usual, you'll see them pop up here. One thing I'll point out though is you want to try and keep this uh, as clean as possible, particularly when it comes to reboots and shutting down of the actual computer. So rather than going into the command line, in other words, into Debian itself, go to settings and then system and then hardware. And then up here in the top right corner, we've got our menu. And from here, you can actually instruct it to reboot the system or shut down the system. So by doing it through Home Assistant itself, that should be cleaner. Now there is other software on this computer that needs to be kept up to date and that will have to get done through the command line. So by that, I'm talking about things like the actual Debian operating system, for instance. So for that, it's a case of going through that original installation process, because when you actually download the newer version of the actual software and install that, it overwrites the existing version. So that's a way to keep those other parts of the actual system up to date. Now, obviously, when it comes to something like OS Agent, that's going to be a completely new file. You'll have to actually download the newer file and then run a command to install that newer version. But if you want to actually update the Home Assistant supervised package, there is one thing to actually watch out for. If I paste in the original command that I used, I've got a dash O option because I want the actual file that we've already got here overwritten. In other words, if I hit return, if I do ls-l and have a look, you'll see I've got a file called homeassistant-supervised.deb. Now, the actual documentation doesn't do that. Uh, it doesn't take into account this particular problem, and this is something that crops up on the forums. So if I hit return and do ls-l, you'll see I've now got a second file. In other words, it doesn't automatically just overwrite the existing file, it creates a completely new file. And the problem is, if you run the original package manager command, what it'll do is it'll try to then install this version, which is the existing version you've got, and you won't end up with the newer version. So that's something to bear in mind, is you want to make sure that the file that you've actually got in this folder is the latest version. And that's why I've got that overwrite option. The alternative is just to delete those files. But like I said, it's just something to bear in mind if you actually try to update this package manager for the supervisor and find it's not actually achieving anything. It's not actually installing and upgrading it. Well, that's probably why. Now, when it comes to actually doing all these upgrades through the command line, one thing I'll point out is that if you do then need to reboot the computer, particularly because you've updated the operating system, for example, 
go back into the GUI of Home Assistant and reboot it from the GUI rather than from the command line because that should be a lot cleaner. Now the final thing that I'll cover is to do with security for Home Assistant because there's plenty of warnings out there about how insecure smart home devices are. So it does make a lot of sense to actually firewall Home Assistant off from the rest of the network and restrict access to it. Now, this is a Debian operating system and it would make sense to use UFW for instance, but as you can see, I don't actually have that installed. And the reason for that is we're actually running Docker on this computer as well. If all I do is install UFW and restrict management access to certain computers, well, it actually starts to fall apart because UFW gets in the way. Now, I could start introducing rules to allow that uh, actual traffic for Docker, but I find it's actually easier to use Proxmox. So what I've got on this Proxmox server is an ability to actually put firewall rules for each individual virtual machine. And what I can do here is restrict access to the actual Home Assistant virtual machine that we've got to only, you know, the actual traffic that's necessary. So MQTT traffic, uh, access to the GUI, access to SSH and so on. But I don't have to worry about the Docker rules. They don't have any impact when it comes to the rules that go into here. So it'll still make the virtual machine secure from the rest of the network, but it means I've got less things to be concerned about by doing all of my actual security here within Proxmox. So that's just something to bear in mind well, thanks for making it to the end of this video. I really do hope you found it useful. If so, then do click the like button and share as that'll help get the video out to more people who might find it useful as well. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please post those in the comments section below. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, then yes, do subscribe. Just remember to set the bell icon to actually send you notifications when new content gets released. Although I also post to Twitter as well as Facebook. If you'd like to help the channel and support it, you can actually make contributions through PayPal and buy me a coffee. I've also got links to Patreon and there's also the joint membership option for YouTube itself. Patreon and YouTube members do have the option to actually benefit from early access as well. But above all, many thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.